Farming in Africa is notorious for its challenges, and for good reason. With vast stretches of land struggling against an unforgiving climate, farmers often have to focus more on survival than on growth. The Sahara Desert looms large, constantly pushing its sand across the land, choking the life out of crops. To make matters worse, the desert is steadily expanding, transforming even more already barren land into a lifeless, dry wasteland. Who's in a better position? The fortunate few whose land sit farther from the Sahara and enjoy more favorable climates. But in Namibia, located on the southwestern tip of the continent, things are different. This country, surrounded by desert on one side and the ocean on the other, has found a surprising solution to make its land thrive, seaweed. It may sound unconventional, but in Namibia, seaweed has become a key player in solving the country's farming woes. Here, traditional farming approaches just won't cut it, and innovative solutions are essential. This coastal African nation is proving that farming doesn't always have to follow the usual playbook. Take a look at this map, showing Namibia's rainfall patterns. While certain regions, mostly in the north and northeast, get a fair amount of rain, it's a tiny area. These areas receive 12 to 20 inches annually, which is decent, but not enough to sustain large-scale farming. The rest of the country? A different story. The majority of the land is dry, and many areas face severe water scarcity. If you follow the western and southern coasts, you'll see the Namib Desert, one of the most extreme environments on Earth. This vast desert, with its towering dunes, stretches over 200 miles along the Atlantic coastline. The conditions here are so harsh that they make other deserts, like China's Gobi Desert, look mild in comparison. In the Namib Desert, rainfall is almost non-existent, less than 0.08 inches annually. While places like the Gobi Desert might get 8 inches of rain per year, Namibia's desert gets almost nothing. Imagine the challenge of farming in such an environment. The temperatures near the shore remain relatively mild, between 48 degrees Fahrenheit and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. But inland, the heat becomes unbearable, often exceeding 113 degrees Fahrenheit during summer. At night, the desert cold can be just as extreme. The wind constantly blows, scattering sand and making the land even more inhospitable. Farming here is nearly impossible, and the few local plants that manage to survive are so specialized and small that they're of little practical use. But Namibia's challenges don't stop with the desert. Only 2% of the land has enough water for farming, and nearly all the rivers in the country are temporary, flowing only when there's enough rainfall. These rivers often dry up, leaving behind nothing more than dry valleys. In short, farming in Namibia is a serious struggle. Yet, despite these difficulties, agriculture still plays an important role in the country, supporting 25% to 40% of the population. However, as Namibia's population continues to grow by around 2% annually, the demand for fertile land is increasing, and the existing resources just aren't enough. That's where the sea comes in. Along Namibia's coastline, where the desert meets the Atlantic Ocean, is the cold Benguela Current, a nutrient-rich water flow that supports an unusual but highly effective solution, seaweed farming. The cool waters and abundant sunlight create ideal conditions for cultivating macrocystis, giant kelp, a type of seaweed. Kelp Blue, a pioneering company, has capitalized on this unique opportunity, establishing seaweed farms off Namibia's coast. Thanks to the nutrient-rich waters and favorable conditions, kelp grows rapidly, up to 24 inches per day. Kelp Blue now farms a massive 74 acres of seaweed, and the farm is expanding by 10 acres every month. The success of this seaweed farm is not just about planting and leaving it to grow. The team behind Kelp Blue carefully monitors the farm using various methods like acoustics, visual checks, water samples, and environmental testing. This allows them to ensure the best possible conditions and optimize the process. The seaweed harvested here is then taken to land, where it's used to create compost, enriching the soil, and making it possible to grow plants in places that would otherwise be unsuitable for farming. So, how does seaweed help with farming? Well, in areas where the soil is poor and lacking essential nutrients, plants often struggle to grow. They produce fewer fruits, grow more slowly, and in the long run, the soil deteriorates further. Chemicals can be used to help plants grow, but these can have harmful side effects, both for the environment and for the people consuming the crops. Kelp is different. It contains all the essential macro and micro elements needed for healthy plant growth, and it's a natural alternative to harmful chemicals. As it decomposes, seaweed boosts the activity of plant cells, regulating water flow, 
and helping plants better survive dry spells. It also strengthens plants, making them more resistant to heat waves and soil salinity, both common issues in Namibia's harsh environment. The results speak for themselves. When used as a fertilizer, kelp has improved crop yields dramatically. Grapes grown with kelp showed a 200% increase in nitrogen uptake and a 3.5% improvement in calcium mobility. Wheat, barley, and corn have all seen similar improvements, with kelp boosting yields and producing larger, healthier crops. For instance, corn grown with seaweed fertilizer had an average plant height of 38 inches, compared to just 24 inches for those grown without it. The yield from the seaweed-treated corn was more than double that of the untreated crop. Watermelons, too, have benefited from this natural fertilizer, with the seaweed-treated melons growing 18 inches long, compared to just 12 inches for those grown without it. The yield from seaweed-fertilized plots was also significantly higher, 107 pounds per plot compared to 72 pounds without the seaweed. But seaweed farming in Namibia doesn't just benefit the land. It also plays a crucial role in supporting marine biodiversity. Kelp forests are like underwater jungles, providing a habitat for a variety of marine creatures. These seaweed forests attract fish, invertebrates, and other seaweed species, creating a thriving ecosystem beneath the surface. In neighboring Kenya, seaweed is also making a difference. The village of Moazaro, once dependent on crops like cassava and maize, turned to seaweed farming after a devastating drought wiped out their traditional crops. The village started planting seaweed along the shore, and by 2008, seaweed farming had spread to 20 villages. With the help of the World Bank and Coastal Development, Kenya established a processing plant that adds value to seaweed products. Today, seaweed in Kenya is used to make soap, shampoo, lotions, and even food products. Kenya's seaweed industry has been a lifeline for many communities, and it's a growing export sector. In 2022, Kenya's seaweed industry produced nearly 100 tons, generating over $30,000 in income. This is a crucial revenue source for a country with limited resources. Similarly, in Tanzania, seaweed farming is the third largest export industry, supporting around 25,000 farmers. Seaweed's potential goes beyond farming and economic benefits. It also helps capture carbon dioxide, making it an excellent tool for combating climate change. Kelp absorbs carbon from the water through photosynthesis and stores it in solid and dissolved forms. This carbon is then locked away for long periods, sometimes over a century, making kelp farms a natural carbon sink. In Namibia, where industries like diamond and uranium mining contribute significantly to the country's carbon emissions, seaweed farming could play a vital role in mitigating these environmental impacts. However, for kelp to make a substantial impact on reducing Namibia's carbon footprint, the country would need to scale up its seaweed farming efforts. Lastly, seaweed may offer a solution to another pressing issue, plastic pollution. While Namibia isn't a major producer of plastic waste, the problem still exists. Recently, a cleanup team found large amounts of plastic waste along the country's beaches. In response, Namibia has banned single-use plastic bottles by 2025 and has already outlawed plastic straws. However, plastic pollution remains a growing concern. Seaweed could help solve this issue too. In Australia, researchers have developed an eco-friendly coating material made from seaweed, which could replace plastic in fast food packaging. This is just one example of how seaweed can be used to combat plastic waste. As Namibia explores the potential of seaweed farming, it might also consider using this versatile resource to help reduce its plastic pollution and protect its coastal environment. Seaweed farming has proven to be a game changer for agriculture marine ecosystems, and even environmental conservation. In Namibia and beyond, it's clear that this simple, natural solution could have a profound impact on the future of farming, sustainability, and the fight against climate change. Have you ever thought that our planet might actually run out of sand? It sounds impossible, right? After all, nature has generously covered almost every continent with vast, dry, sandy areas. Just look at the Sahara Desert, stretching over 3.5 million square miles. It covers 8% of the Earth's land. You wouldn't expect a shortage of the sand there was just a thin layer. But the dunes of the Sahara can reach heights of 590 feet, almost the height of two big bends stacked on top of each other. In other words, this one massive desert alone has enough sand to supply several countries. But despite this abundance, scientists are warning us about a sand shortage. African countries, in particular, are digging up sand aggressively. The demand is growing so fast that it could lead to a disaster. Let's explore how we got here and what the future holds for Africa if this continues. First, why is there a sand shortage when the world has so much of it? Why aren't we just using all that sand in the deserts? 
It turns out that the sand in deserts like the Sahara and Gobi is not useful for human needs. The grains are smooth, tiny, and rounded, shaped by the wind that constantly sweeps across these vast stretches. And desert sand is often full of impurities, minerals, sulfides, and chlorides that make it unsuitable for construction. The sand we need is not in the desert. What humans require is angular sand, the kind that can bind together to form solid materials. This sand is found in riverbeds, floodplains, lakes, and along coastlines, places where water and nature have shaped it to be perfect for construction. But there's much less of it in these areas compared to deserts. Every year, around 53 million tons of sand are extracted from rivers, lakes, and beaches. That's about 44 pounds of sand per person every single day. And no one's stopping because the demand is enormous. Concrete is the main reason for the sand extraction. It takes 200 tons of sand to build a typical concrete house, and for larger projects, the amount skyrockets. The Burj Khalifa in Dubai, for example, used 12,254 tons of concrete, and modern buildings also need massive amounts of glass. The Burj Khalifa required 188 million square feet of glass. But not just buildings, almost every modern technology relies on sand. Smartphones, cars, even computer chips all require sand, specifically quartz sand. Since the early 2000s, China alone has used more sand every three years than the United States did in the entire 20th century. With mega projects popping up everywhere, it's no surprise that China is a major consumer. In 2022, Leiden University's study projected that in the next four decades, the demand for sand will increase by 45%. To meet this need, humanity will have to extract an additional 20 billion tons of sand. Nature is already struggling to replenish sand in rivers and lakes and the situation is expected to worsen. Now, let's focus on Africa, a continent where the sand shortage seems to be ignored, even as countries mine sand at an alarming rate. Take Kenya, for example. With a population of 53.4 million in 2023, Kenya needs a lot of sand for construction, and the demand will only grow as the population doubles in the next 40 years. Kenya's Vision 2030 plan aims to raise living standards and income, which naturally requires significant infrastructure development. This means more sand for concrete, glass, and more. Kenya relies heavily on river sand, but this practice is causing major environmental problems. In eastern Makwani County, sand mining has reduced the availability of water from local rivers. During the dry season, the sand in riverbed stores water, which locals rely on for drinking and agriculture. But excessive sand mining is disrupting this natural process, leaving the rivers dry and worsening water scarcity. This practice isn't just bad for water supply, it's also damaging ecosystems. Sand mining in the area has led to the destruction of vital habitats for birds and animals, and the land is becoming less fertile over time. Kenya isn't known for having much fertile land, so the loss of natural resources is a big concern. Additionally, illegal sand mining is rampant in the country, with criminal cartels exploiting the situation. A study showed that up to 500 dump trucks filled with illegally mined sand leave Makwani County daily. But there's hope. In Makwani, Authorities have established a central body to regulate sand mining. This has reduced illegal mining, but the problem persists in other regions. Without better regulation, Kenya and other African countries could face a serious ecological and water crisis. Moving on to West Africa, we find Sierra Leone, where the coastal sand is being mined at an unsustainable rate. Sierra Leone's beaches, with their dense mangrove forests, are crucial breeding grounds for fish and other marine life. However, as sand mining intensifies, these natural barriers are disappearing. The price of sand in Sierra Leone has surged from $25 per ton in 2012 to $200 in 2021 due to increased demand from the construction and glass industries. Sand mining provides jobs for many, but it's also causing severe problems. Coastal sand helps protect communities from erosion and extreme weather. Without it, coastal areas are more vulnerable to storms and flooding. In 2022, a flood in Bure, a fishing village, washed away a cemetery, and the coastline is eroding rapidly due to sand mining. Mangrove forests are being destroyed, which is harming fish, birds, and turtles. The loss of biodiversity is devastating for local communities that rely on fishing for their livelihoods. Sierra Leone's tourism industry, once buoyed by its beautiful beaches, is also suffering. In 2019, tourism generated $83 million, a significant amount for a country with a GDP of just $7 billion. But as the beaches disappear, tourists are fewer, and the local economy is struggling. 
People who lost their jobs in tourism are turning to sand mining, which only makes the problem worse. Next, let's talk about Uganda. While Uganda is known for its lush landscapes, it's also facing its own sand mining crisis. In the Luwera region, sand is being extracted from quarries, wetlands, and river systems that flow into Lake Victoria. This area is crucial for fish breeding and provides vital resources for local communities. But the intense sand mining is damaging the ecosystem, especially since the sand extracted from this region is high quality, containing 99.95% silicon, ideal for glass production. The Ugandan government has allowed sand mining in the region, but locals report that miners are ignoring restrictions, digging deeper than allowed. This is causing environmental damage and flooding nearby homes and farms. The government justifies the mining by saying that Uganda needs the sand to support its growing infrastructure needs. Between 2017 and 2020, the government allocated billions of dollars to construction projects, and in the early 2020s, Uganda announced a $5.3 billion investment in urbanization and housing. However, these projects are also draining natural resources. In Uganda, sand mining is a double-edged sword. While it provides much-needed materials for development, it's also damaging ecosystems and contributing to the global sand shortage. The situation is further complicated by the involvement of Chinese companies, which raises concerns among locals who feel they are being exploited. High poverty levels also mean that teenagers are often forced to mine sand to pay for school supplies, further exacerbating the problem. So what can be done? Scientists are exploring alternatives to sand. For example, graphene, developed at Manchester and Rice University, has been used to improve concrete strength. But it's much more expensive than sand, making it an impractical solution for most countries. Recycled glass has also been proposed as a replacement for sand and concrete. But there isn't enough glass waste to replace sand completely, especially in Africa. For now, regular sand remains irreplaceable. If the current rate of sand extraction continues, the world could face a severe shortage, especially in Africa, where sand mining is already causing significant environmental and social problems. If things don't change, the only sand left in Africa might be in the Sahara Desert.